everyone recognizes this famous Great White Way. It's Times Square at 7th Avenue and Broadway in New York City. To people all over the wide world, the sight of these flashing signs, the theaters, restaurants, shops, hotels, and office buildings don't just mean a section of our largest city. They mean America. But the true picture of America is not complete without small town USA. Our cities and towns are populated by people who have the highest standard of living of any nation. Busy supplying the modern products that create this high standard of living are the retail outlets. For instance, some 80,000 appliance radio television dealers, such as this one, have a major franchise and serve the buying public. Here's a young couple shopping for a refrigerator. They're in what marketing experts call the age of accumulation and very busy getting the many things that a home needs. But they have to be sold. There are many different makes and models and Americans are smart shoppers. They've become used to looking for that extra feature for their money. The dealer must sense the feature that will complete the selling job and get the order. Once a model has been selected as suitable in capacity and interior design, the exterior finish is asked about. What is this finish? And is it durable? The finish is porcelain enamel. Porcelain enamel is a ceramic coating made up of minerals processed into glass and fused with metal at high temperature. This smart dealer has a demonstration table to show the durability of the finish. Just as burning matches cannot harm the porcelain, neither can you scratch it by cutting onions, tomatoes, or bread directly on the surface. Since the kitchen is the center that gets a vigorous workout three times a day in American homes, the durability of porcelain enamel to resist abuse and keep appliances beautiful is most important. A damp rag removes all stains in quick order. Porcelain enamel is non-porous and so highly acid resistant that lemon juice, alcohol, vinegar, or boiling water can do no harm to the surface. When foreign matter gets on the surface, it comes off in a jiffy. This is why any product with a porcelain finish stays new looking for a lifetime. Even kiss-proof lipstick can't stain porcelain enamel. What steps in manufacture produce this highly resistant finish? Let's visit the plant of one of the world's largest suppliers to the ceramic industry. This is Pemco Corporation in Baltimore, Maryland. Pemco was founded in 1910 by Carl and Heinrich Turk as the pioneer manufacturer of raw materials for porcelain enamel. From the second floor of a little house in the city, Pemco grew to this large plant on a 12-acre site. The main building is over two blocks long. Raw materials arriving by rail are brought to this siding right by the plant. Cars carrying either bulk or bag material are unloaded daily. Materials used in large quantities are feldspar, silica, borax, soda ash, nepheline cyanite, fluor spar, and nitrate of soda. The material is taken by automatic conveyors to these large storage bins. There are 11 bins that hold 26 carloads of bulk material, or over 2 million pounds. The raw material then goes through these valves, operated by electricity and compressed air, and into a weighing car in the exact amount called for. The operator moves from one bin to another, making up a batch consisting sometimes of up to 15 different ingredients. 
A special locking device on each of the overhead valves assures receiving the correct amount of material. The bins and containers from which the material flows are lined with acid-proof tile so that there's complete freedom from contamination. With its collection of bulk material gathered, the weighing car releases the load and proceeds to get together another one. This goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The material then flows through a hopper and moves on to a conveyor belt. Thus, the bulk material used to make porcelain enamel is taken automatically into the weighing room, where it meets with the bagged materials also used in making a batch. This storage room holds 25 carloads of the bagged materials that are used along with bulk to make up a batch. And they come from this country and also from overseas. There's Taylor clay from England, potassium nitrate from Germany, cobalt and manganese from Africa, cryolite from Greenland, and nickel oxide from Canada. When the tank has been loaded with its 1,800-pound batch, it moves into position on this turntable, and an empty tank takes its place for filling. Next, the tank is connected to an overhead crane to be taken for blending in one of the four Sturtevant blenders. Now that we have all of the raw materials together, we will see the automatic production of porcelain enamel frit, step by step. Frit is the name for the small pieces of glass that this raw material is turned into after it's been blended and then smelted at about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. These four blenders thoroughly mix the raw materials. The batch is carried to one of the blenders and dumped. Baffle plates inside help mix the material thoroughly which takes approximately 12 minutes. You've probably noticed that production at Pemco Corporation is a highly mechanized process with a relatively small number of experienced employees necessary in comparison with the volume of material handled and the size of the machinery involved. This mechanized production removes the possibility of human error and produces a finished product, porcelain enamel frit of unvarying uniformity. This type of production is right in step with the needs of the nation's manufacturers, who will apply the porcelain finish to their mass production assembly lines. Following blending, the batch is taken by tow motor to the appropriate one of Pemco's battery of continuous smelters. By the appropriate smelter, we mean that a ground coat, which is dark, is never run in a smelter reserved for cover coat, which is either white or clear in appearance. Thus, contamination by the dissimilar ingredients used in making a ground coat and a cover coat is prevented. You are now at the charging end of the smelter. Smelters are called continuous because a raw batch is continuously being fed in at one end, is melted down into molten compounded glass, which continuously passes out the other end of the smelter. This automatic method of frit production was developed and patented by Pemco back in 1933. To feed these hungry monsters requires an advanced materials handling system. The smelters run 24 hours a day, seven days a week for months on end. Emco's introduction of continuously smelted frits was recognized as one of the greatest developments in the porcelain enamel industry. These are the screws that push the raw batch into the smelter. Loading is done at a precise speed in keeping with the temperature and type of frit being smelted. This battery of continuous smelters makes the Pemco plant a symphony of massive forms and sensitive mechanisms. These roaring infernos are in constant production. Temperature at each of the smelters ranges from 2000 to 2400 degrees Fahrenheit is automatically controlled to tolerances of a few degrees of temperature 
by electric eye and recording pyrometers. A line denoting the temperature of the smelter stays straight as an arrow on its required temperature at all times. In addition to these recorded checks on the smelters, visual checks are made by the general foreman of the Frit department. He looks in to see that the pile of raw material is melting as it should. Another check is made with an optical pyrometer, which enables the operator to take the temperature of the smelter rapidly, even on minute spots or moving objects. Unusually close and rapid temperature determinations are obtained. As the batch melts, it becomes molten glass and moves over the lip of the smelter. The liquid here is approximately 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. The molten glass then falls between two water-cooled rollers, which squeeze it into a thin sheet that passes through an opening in the floor and down a chute to be crushed. This thin sheet is about 30 thousandths of an inch thick, and its width is controlled by the rate of flow of the liquid glass over the lip of the smelter. For efficient crushing, this correct thickness of the continuous sheet is maintained. The sheet of compounded glass rolls into these special crushers made of ceramic material that is steel hard. Because they are of ceramic material, Particles from the crushers cannot contaminate the glass. Old-fashioned crushers were made of metal, and frequently iron particles would come off into the glass during the crushing operation and have to be eliminated before bagging. After passing through the crushers, the glass material falls into conveyor buckets underneath. These buckets are filled, emptied, and refilled thousands of times a day in their unending procession from the pit up to a rotating drum high overhead in which the fragments are cooled. The conveyor buckets containing the fragments of glass are tripped automatically and go into a long, water-cooled drum. As the drum rotates, the glass passes to the other end and its temperature is brought down to a point where it can be bagged when cooling is completed. The flake fragments are then hammered into small particles by these new type ceramic hammers, which, like the other crushers we saw, replaced metal hammers and give freedom from contamination by metal particles. To show these hammers in operation, we have removed the outside housing which normally covers them. After crossing a magnetic separator to remove all traces of iron that might be present, the frit drops in a stream into a hopper and is now in uniform size. In the early days of frit manufacture, the product was shipped out in barrels. There was always the possibility that splinters would get into the product through the abrasive nature of the frit. Now, sturdy 100-pound bags are used, which are easier to handle and eliminate contamination in shipping. Another of the many controls PEMCO takes to assure a uniform quality in porcelain enamel frit is to sample the product regularly. From every 25 bags of frit, a composite sample is made up and sent to the control laboratory where it is tested against a standard sample kept for this purpose. The number of the particular batch is stenciled to the small sample bag, just as it appears on each 100-pound bag. Then, if the sample is not up to standard, the entire lot of bags can be held up from shipment. This is a water quench smelter. Glaze frit, which is used by companies making artware, tile, and dinnerware, is seen being quenched in water. The sudden change of temperature when the molten liquid hits the water shatters the glass into irregular fragments. The fragments are about the size of coarse sugar and uh, look something like popcorn. This glaze frit is applied to clay rather than to metal. It is fused on clay bodies at higher temperature and for a longer period of time than it is necessary for porcelain enamel.
The wet glaze frit is dried in a horizontal gas-fired dryer. This rotary dryer is lined with porcelain tile, which prevents metal contamination during the drying process. A separating screen rejects particles that are larger than the required size. You've seen white frit and clear frit. This is ground coat frit from the smelter. A complete record is maintained on each smelt. These are on gas consumption, time required for each smelt, charger speed, temperature, and the weight of batch tanks. AMCO's consumption of gas is enough to handle easily the cooking requirements for a city the size of Knoxville, Tennessee, or Tampa, Florida for an entire year. The muffled drawer of the rotary smelters, those controlled mechanical volcanoes of the industry, is like a squadron of jet airplanes warming up. When the batch is ready for pouring, the operator lowers the smelter slowly. From a slight trickle, the molten glass turns into a steady stream, which falls into cooling water. The change of temperature shatters the liquid into many tiny particles. Frit can be applied to clayware and glass, as well as to metal. Ceramic glaze frit was melted on these attractive examples from the dinnerware industry. An important factor in glaze frits is the need for the correct thermal expansion for the frit, with the clay body to which it will be applied. Otherwise, when the underbody expands out of a slight variation, the glaze will jump or craze and be rejected. Glaze frit formulas must therefore be custom designed to fit each customer's requirements. Colors are needed for ceramic ware and porcelain enamel, and they must be inorganic in nature. Here in Pemco's ox lending in a tumbler, this yellow raw material is ground in a micro-pulverizing machine. This particular color, after it has been calcined, which is a firing operation necessary for such colors, will appear pink. Following pulverizing, the stain is placed in crucibles on one of these cars and readied for calcining in a long harrop kill. Pemco began making oxides in the 1930s and was the pioneer frit manufacturer to do so. The oxide department manufactures 20 basic colors from which no less than 30,000 shades can be obtained. This meets the demand of the buying public, which is showing keen interest in colored appliances such as refrigerators and stoves. The public also wants color in sanitary wear, such as bathroom fixtures, in dinnerware and in tiles, all of which employ frit and color in the making. The coloring oxides are for the most part prepared from metallic oxides. To make a green color, for instance, oxide of chrome is combined with alumina and heated at 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. Calcining temperatures vary for each different color. Calcining of the oxide is accurately controlled as to temperature, length of time in the kill, and atmospheric conditions. After removal from the tunnel kill, the car is moved to where the oxide can cool down. The oxide then is ready to be pulverized and tested before it is removed to the storage room. Frit is also used in the making of glass colors at Pemco. There's a different series of colors for beverage bottles, light bulbs, dinnerware, cosmetic containers, fired on labels, tumblers, and convexing colors. Looking not unlike a beating heart, this red glass color is for application to milk bottles. An important requirement for this color is the ability to withstand strong caustic attack. Since milk bottles are repeatedly scrubbed and sterilized, and the colors must last as long as the bottles. Expansion under heat must also match that of the bottle. This yellow paste is being produced for the sign making industry. It will probably be one of several colors used and will be forced through a silk screen onto porcelain enamel signs. Here are examples of porcelain enamel signs from all over the world. Porcelain signs withstand the forces of nature and need only be washed periodically to retain their original luster. For manufacturers using screening pastes, Penco has a color laboratory with shelves containing numerous color plates for reference. Asked to match a certain color from a sample submitted, a technician refers to this ample file. After selecting a plate that matches, the technician consults his formula book, getting key information from the back of the plate. Then he carefully weighs the ingredients so he can mix an enamel screen paste with squeegee oil. A color match can be made usually within 24 hours of receipt.
The color being matched is applied through a silk screen, duplicating in miniature the application by a sign maker. A sample then is sent to the customer. A reference shelf is kept for porcelain enamel colors also. Here, a container cover is being matched for color. To make a satisfactory color match, it is important to know whether the frit used should be acid resistant, clear, opaque, satin, or matte. The sample to be matched can be sent in any shape or form. Weighing to make a porcelain enamel color plate is done with the same exactness as in all other weighing operations. One percentage off can mean the difference between success and failure with the enamel. The color or oxide is then milled in a three pound laboratory mill together with the proper frit and electrolytes and water. The mill revolves for approximately three hours. Then the liquid is screened and ready for dipping or spraying onto plates. The wet enamel process is in wide use today. This laboratory step duplicates in miniature the way a ground coat of porcelain enamel is applied to metal products. After dipping to cover the metal, the plate passes slowly through this continuous furnace which fuses the wet porcelain to the plate. The ability to flow evenly over the plate and adhere without making irregular flow marks is an important quality in the enamel. When a cover coat is sprayed on, the weight of the plate is checked and on each subsequent spraying. Underspraying or overspraying, rather than following the weight specified, will affect the end color shading. Incidentally, we are following through the steps necessary in making a porcelain enamel color plate. However, to show you some of the different colors involved, we have not followed one particular color plate through, but a representative assortment. To fuse the enamel to the plate, the plate is dried and then put into this laboratory box furnace, which is 1500 degrees Fahrenheit inside. It stays inside three or four minutes, and the porcelain is fused to the steel. The plate is withdrawn and cooled on a rack, after which the match is confirmed. Here we see a plate being checked on a color and color difference meter. This instrument picks up the reflectance and compares it against a standard sample. If the color is the same between short-fired and long-fired plates, the enamel has good stability and data is recorded on the plate. In the frit control department, tests are made on those composite samples that were taken back in the continuous smelter department. The mill room samples are tested here also. Water is added to the frit sample, which is put into a cylinder. Then a hydraulic pump compresses the frit and water into a small cylindrical form. This is placed on a steel plate for firing, along with approved standard samples from this same type frit. When placed in a furnace and heated, the plate is tripped and the melted frit shows its rate of flow and fusion with that of the standard. Glazed frit from the milling department is tested with standard samples for color opacity and softness. Called the button test, a plate may be seen in the right of the picture. This special furnace is designed for testing in the development and control of aluminum enamel frits and colors. Enameled aluminum will soon be a big factor in the growing architectural market. Pemco porcelain enamel frit for export shipment has only a short journey from the warehouse to waiting ships at the port of Baltimore, one of America's best equipped seaports. Frit is exported to Europe, South America, Australia, and many other points of the globe. It is used to give a durable and beautiful finish to a wide variety of products. These include architectural curtain wall panels, aeronautical instruments, automobile parts, bathroom fixtures, and gasoline pumps or a manufacturer will give this finish to hot water tank interiors, kitchen pots and pans, photographic lab equipment, refrigerators, roofing shingles, signboards, or surgical equipment. And to go further, and still not entirely cover the waterfront on the variety of products that exist, we can mention wash tubs, washing machines, water coolers, and vending machines. 
With the great reconstruction job being done in Europe and the building boom in South America's urban centers, there's a heavy call for porcelain enamel to give a lasting finish and lifetime beauty. As the ship steams out to sea, let's once again look in on some old friends. Remember the young couple that was contemplating the purchase of a refrigerator? While you've been learning the inner workings and controls used in the making of a porcelain enamel finish, that young couple has seen the proof of the pudding. The salesman's demonstration actually took only a few minutes, using a book of safety matches, a kitchen knife, an onion, lemon, and lipstick. He showed his prospects that a porcelain finish is heat proof, acid resistant, scratch proof, and therefore will stay new looking after years of service. What does it all add up to? A sale. The young lady knows the refrigerator she is buying has the durability needed to withstand the use it will get. And hubby knows he's getting the finest in finishes for his new appliance. So here's an important thing to remember. If you're interested in making a sale, and who isn't, remember you can't go wrong if you always begin with a good finish.